In 476 AD, Rome fell. A barbarian named Odacer deposed the last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustus, and established his own barbarian kingdom in Italy. Thus ended the era of antiquity. For the next 300 years, Europe plunged into darkness. But soon, on the battlefields where legionaries once dominated, a new class of warriors emerged, the knights. Mounted warriors whose main symbol became plate armor. But did knights really wear such armor for most of history? It might surprise some of you, but full plate armor appeared in Europe even after the advent of the first firearms. For example, in the Battle of Cressy, which occurred in the early stages of the Hundred Years' War, cannons were already in use, but none of the knights wore full plate armor. So what kind of armor should really be associated with knights? Why did full plate armor only emerge in Europe? And why didn't even the Romans who had the means armor their legionaries in plate? Let's start with who these knights really were and how they came about. Although the English word knight appeared around 1100 AD, the type of soldier that would later be called a knight existed much earlier. Groups of heavily armed soldiers on horseback were used in battles by ancient Greeks and Romans, but only in the 8th century AD did well-trained, heavily armed elite soldiers begin to emerge among the Franks, fitting the description of a knight. But don't think they just appeared on their own. Chivalry manifested itself in the Frankish state primarily during the Arab invasion, following the conquest of the Visigoth kingdom in Spain, when the Arabs invaded Gao. In Gao, it was beyond the capabilities of free peasants to perform cavalry service in distant campaigns, and King of Franks had to rely on lords to create heavy cavalry. Charlemagne began granting them church and crown lands in exchange for cavalry service. Thus, vassals appeared subjects of the king who were ready at any moment to defend the interest of their lord with weapons and on horseback. Now let's talk about their weapons and armor. As you may have guessed, this is the 8th century, and it's still almost 600 years before the invention of full plate armor. But the armor of Frankish knights existed, and it was the best in Europe because they could afford it. The main type of armor for Frankish knights was chainmail. It had the form of a shirt with a hem reaching mid-thigh and short sleeves down to the elbows. The chainmail consisted of 20,000 to 25,000 small rings. Creating such armor for a blacksmith was a challenging task, as connecting all the rings had to be done manually. Hence, chainmail was very expensive. However, this type of armor had several advantages. Firstly, Despite its relatively light weight, it provided an acceptable level of protection against slashing blows of swords or axes. Secondly, in case of breakage, it could be easily repaired by simply replacing damaged rings. Thirdly, this flexible armor made of metal rings did not restrict the movements of the warrior. All these factors made chainmail the primary armor of knights in the Middle Ages and they continued to wear it until the appearance of full plate armor. In other words, chainmail was actually the armor of the medieval knight. However, due to its high cost, only noble and wealthy warriors could afford such armor. Frankish craftsmen long held a monopoly to the production of chainmail. To restrict the availability of armor to enemies, Charlemagne issued several laws prohibiting the export of chainmail beyond the kingdom. The prohibition was constantly tightened. For instance, warriors were not allowed to pawn their armor for debts or even temporarily transfer them to a trader. Apparently, this prohibition was periodically violated as archaeologists discover remnants of Frankish-made armor far beyond the empire, such as in England, Scandinavia, and even Ruthenia. The head of Frankish cavalry warriors was protected by a simple iron helmet of segmented construction. The dome of the helmet was made of two or four parts, connected to each other by rivets. At the bottom, the helmet's body was tightened with an iron rim. Sometimes, a projecting bar covering the nose for face protection was attached to this rim, and a chainmail aventail for neck protection could also be added. The prevailing shape of the helmet remained cosinal for a long time. Such a helmet allowed glancing off side blows. 
The helmet was worn over a soft padded liner, serving to absorb impacts and protect the warrior from concussion. However, particularly wealthy warriors could afford more luxurious helmets decorated with silver and gold. Apart from purely aesthetic value, a sparkling helmet adorned with decorations distinguished the military commander from the crowd, indicating his position on the battlefield to the soldiers. Shields were mostly round and made of planks of alder, poplar, and oak. To give it a convex shape, wooden planks were steamed and then joined at the ends, much like how barrels are made today. Viking Age swords were primarily one-handed and had a wide blade that slightly tapered toward the tip. The blade length averaged 27 to 32 inches. The sword's hilt was cast from bronze and often manufactured separately from the blade. Sometimes other craftsmen did this, decorating and embellishing the hilt according to the specific customer's taste. The sword was never the main weapon of a mounted warrior. It was more of a status symbol in the early Middle Ages. When humanity hadn't yet invented sports cars and expensive watches, feudal lords demonstrated their wealth through swords. This is easily understood by looking at the hilts of some surviving Carolingian swords. These golden patterns hardly provided any advantage in battle. The main weapon of the rider was the lance. Its shaft length reached 10 to 13 feet. A massive iron tip was fitted to the end of the shaft, designed not only for thrusting, but also for delivering slashing blows. Its distinctive feature was the wings, which served a role similar to the crossguard of a sword. You might be interested in knowing how much a complete set of such weaponry cost in the early Middle Ages. From surviving sources of that time, it is known that chainmail was valued at 12 solidi, the helmet at 6 solidi, a sword with scabbard at 7 solidi, if it wasn't adorned with gold, spear and shield at 2 solidi. And of course, you had to buy a horse. A horse cost from 3 to 7 solidi. The cost of the entire equipment was thus equivalent to the value of a herd of 15 cows. In other words, only a very wealthy person could afford a complete set of armor. And such knightly equipment could have remained unchanged for a very long time. For example, among European neighbors in Russia and in the Middle East, chainmail remained the primary type of armor. Only later, in some places, it was reinforced with small metal plates. However, in the East, experiments with armor essentially came to an end. But why did armor in the West differ so much from Eastern armor? The reason lies in the changing tactics of knightly combat, prompting knights to seek more reliable armor than chainmail. In the early Middle Ages, mounted warriors used spears much like infantry, holding them with two hands or one hand raised above the head. However, the introduction of stirrups and saddles with a high cantle allowed knights to firmly fix the lance, holding it with one hand and tucking it under the armpit. Combined with a lance rest, this allowed concentrating all the inertia of the horse and the knight on the weapon's tip, maintaining precision and control. Just imagine a 1,100 pound, 500 kilogram horse traveling at 50 to 60 miles per hour that knocks you down with its rider's spear. Such a blow was so monstrous that it could not only knock down, but often pierce through opponents. This style of combat became particularly popular among knights in the 11th century, leading them to completely change their equipment. Firstly, the shape of the shield needed to be changed from round to almond shape. Its dimensions corresponded to the approximate space between the horse's neck and the rider's thigh. The narrow lower part protected the left leg of the rider, and the pronounced upper curve covered the shoulder and torso. However, receiving blows from an opponent on the shield created another problem. The opponent's lance could slide upward, hitting the knight in the face. The problem was solved by reinforcing the helmet. Probably the most famous helmet of the 11th century was the Great Helm. Despite limiting visibility and being very heavy, it effectively protected the head from lance strikes. Yet, if such a cavalry warrior broke into the ranks of enemy infantry, he could also receive unpleasant blows to the legs with melee weapons. Therefore, knights had to clad themselves from head to toe in chainmail, 
prompting a change in the shield shape again to a smaller one, the heater shield. The shield would later become the standard for knights. This is how a typical knight of Western Europe looked in the 12th century. A great helm, chainmail covering the entire body, a heater shield, and a longer lance with the narrower tip to penetrate the opponent's chainmail. But as we mentioned earlier, chainmail was far from the ideal armor, and feudal lords, who had the means to buy better armor, constantly sought improvements. Naturally, where there is demand, there is supply. Medieval craftsmen remembered the Roman water mill, which allowed them to create what knights could only dream of before. In the 13th century, medieval craftsmen in Western Europe reinvented the water mill, using it to power various mechanisms, such as the trip hammer. This innovation allowed massive hammers, with equal force, to strike the same spot an infinite number of times. This technology enabled the creation of large metal plates with nearly uniform thickness. From these plates, new types of armor emerged, such as the brigandine, a medieval armored vest. This armor was typically made from dense fabric, canvas, or leather, with an internal lining of small elongated steel plates attached to the fabric, sometimes with the second layer of fabric inside. This armor emerged in the mid-13th century and became widely used by knights. It's important to note that it didn't replace chainmail. Instead, it was worn over it, providing double protection for the body. Additionally, metal plates forged using watermill technology were used to create plate gloves, shoulder pads, thigh guards, essentially protection for all parts of the knight's body. The most interesting developments occurred with helmets, as these metal plates allowed for the creation of various helmet designs. In the early 14th century, a new type of helmet gained popularity among knights in Western Europe. Unlike the Great Helm, it featured a movable visor, and this helmet was called the bassinet. With the pointed skull and extensions down the back and on the sides to protect the neck, a male coif was usually attached to the lower edge of the helmet for throat, neck, and shoulder protection. As mentioned earlier, various forms of movable visors were often used on this helmet such as the well-known hound skull visor or the rounded visor. Also, changes occurred in the knight's weaponry, specifically the sword. With the increased use of more advanced armor, the bastard sword, also known as the hand and a half sword, emerged. It featured an elongated hilt, allowing it to be used with one or two hands. Although these swords didn't provide a full two-handed grip, they allowed their owners to wield a shield in the left hand or use it as a two-hand sword for a more powerful strike. But this was just the beginning as armor continued to improve. Soon, neither the lance nor the sword could inflict serious harm on a knight. Medieval craftsmen began by increasing the size of brigandine plates, eventually merging them into a single entity, creating a steel cuirass, and soon thereafter, a full suit of plate armor. But why did European blacksmiths and craftsmen figure out how to make such armor, while the Romans, with the same technology and financial resources that medieval kings couldn't dream of, never invented anything similar? The answer is quite evident. Technologically, the Romans could indeed produce similar protective elements, as seen in the Lorica Segmentata, which also consisted of steel plates and resembled medieval brigandine. However, one must remember the reasons for the emergence of full plate armor in Europe, and you'll understand that the Romans simply had no need for full plate armor. First of all, unlike medieval warriors, the Romans didn't encounter the maneuver known as the knightly lance charge. Secondly, as cynical as it may sound, the life of a legionnaire wasn't valued by Roman politicians as much as the cost they would incur for a full suit of armor for their soldiers. In contrast to the Roman Empire, the armies of medieval states were predominantly composed of the aristocracy, who bought their own armor. Thus, outfitting oneself, one's children, friends, and brothers, who often fought alongside them, in the best armor was crucial, as there is nothing more precious to a person than their own life. This feudal system in the 15th century gave rise to full plate armor. It first appeared where resources and finances allowed it, 
namely in regions with the wealthiest feudal lords and abundant good quality iron ore, northern Italy and southern Germany, where craftsmen not only learned to craft full plate armor, but also mastered proper tempering techniques. This is why in Italy, the wealthiest region in Europe, they began manufacturing the armor that would become the symbol of chivalry in the future, the Milanese armor. It was one of the earliest full plate armors, covering the entire body with metal plates as the name suggests. A similar armor, the Gothic plate armor, appeared a bit later in what is now Germany. Armors were not only worn by knights, but also by their houses, effectively turning a feudal warrior into a living tank. Just take a look at how impressive a knight looks on an armored horse. By the 16th century, when the peak of protection was reached, expansive armors turned into works of art. For example, the armor of George Clifford, 3rd Earl of Cumberland, crafted around 1580 to 85 AD, was made of steel, etched, blued, and gilt. By the way, if you think such armors are heavy, you might be surprised. They weigh only 60 pounds, even less than the equipment of a modern US soldier. Or consider the armor of Henry II, King of France, dated 1555. The surfaces are covered with dense leafy curls, inhabited by human figures and a variety of creatures borrowed from the Italian language. It weighed even less, only 53 pounds and 4 ounces. Another example is the armor of the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I, crafted in 1549. You might think it doesn't look as impressive as the previous ones, but just look at the engravings on it. They are like complete paintings. Imagine how expensive such armors were. To sum it up once again and dispel prevailing myths about medieval armor, full plate armor was invented only in the late Middle Ages in the 15th century, and its peak use came in the 16th century, when the Middle Ages essentially had already concluded. I'd like to debunk another established myth. Despite the dominance of fully armored cavalry on medieval battlefields, the best armors didn't always provide a significant advantage in combat. For instance, in early 15th century Bohemia, modern-day Czech Republic, a peasant uprising took place against whom five crusades were organized. The best knights of Europe couldn't do anything against a bunch of peasants for 20 years because they came up with a weapon that the knightly cavalry simply couldn't counter. But that's another story. If you want to know more about that weapon, write in the comments and we'll make a video about it. And if you're curious about why plate armor disappeared from battlefields, you can watch this video on the left where we explain in detail. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. See you!